Hello everyone, this is Tom in Los Angeles. Thanks for watching this video um, about uh, Canto 14 of Inferno. Canto 14 is uh, not as uh, tortured as Canto 13 was. Uh, it's actually quite um, more smooth in, in terms of style and, and, and reading, but uh, it's really dense. It's, it might be even more intricate and dense in terms of meaning and uh, and it's pretty uh, exciting uh, once we decipher what's what's behind it so i'm gonna jump right into it because there's a a lot to unpack uh, in canto 14 dante uh, places the violent against uh, god in his person uh, and in his possessions so we have left uh, Virgil and Dante just at the as they uh, were talking to this uh, Bush uh, who was the anonymous Florentine who committed suicide. Compelled by the love I bear my native place, I gathered the scattered sprays and gave them again to him who was already faint of voice. This is a sign of respect and uh, affection from Dante's side for his, uh, his city despite the fact that they have ex exiled him, he is uh, still uh, having these feelings for, for some people, at least, uh, who live in Florence and for the city itself. He is uh, looking at a desert that uh, he later compares to the desert of Libya, um, uh, with a sand that is uh, deep and dry. And here we stayed our steps at the very edge. The ground was dry, deep sand, resembling that which Cato trod. Um, o vengeance of God, how much should you be feared by all of those who read what my eyes saw? Uh, the fact that Dante mentions Cato here, on one hand, uh, already it requires uh, some classical or ancient uh, um, history knowledge, because we need to know who Cato was, etc., and like. As always with Dante, you read one canto and you should have at least uh, 12 books from the classical history and mythology to understand what he's talking about. Uh, in, uh, in this case, he's quoting Cato um, historically because um, the author Lucan, in his Pharsalia, that we've seen already before, in Book 9 of Pharsalia, he, where he talks about the Roman Civil War, uh, we can see in this book uh, Cato, who's leading the remains of Pompeo's army through the North African desert. The way Cato uh, leads this army through the desert is particularly proud, because as part of the story, we are told that uh, he refused to have any type of uh, horse or or help in in marching through the desert. He was just he was just walking through the desert and. Um, incredible heat by himself. So that's what Dante is referring to historically. However, on the other hand, uh, Dante is also referring to Cato or Cato for uh, um, the reason that uh, Cato in history um, is remembered for being a suicide. And uh, there is a specific uh, circumstance in which he committed suicide, etc. But we just got out of the circle of suicides and so it's not a, a coincidence that Cato appears here. We also need to note that uh, Cato, despite being a suicide, uh, we will find him in uh, at the bottom of the mountain of purgatory as the main guardian of purgatory uh, for reasons that we will analyze later but uh, as always there's not only one or, or a couple of things behind Dante's choices. There's always a uh, endless ramification of, uh, of consequences that, of which, as I said before, I am personally missing probably the majority, but at least I'm trying to share with you some of them. What Dante sees here in this, uh, in this desert, in this huge uh, plain of sand, is a great assemblage of naked souls in herds all of whom mourned most miserably and seem to be subject to different laws. They are crying, they are lamenting, and uh, there are three different types of condemned souls here. They're explained very clearly. Some lay upon the ground, supine. These are the blasphemers, 
uh, violence against the person of God. Some said hunched up, and uh, these are the usurers that we have mentioned before as well. They are hunched up because this recalls the position of the users, the money changers who were always at their little table counting money, uh, while others walked restlessly about. The, the ones who walk restlessly about are the sodomites. So users and sodomites are the ones who committed violence against uh, nature, or God in his uh, uh, possessions or nature, uh, violence against uh, God's daughter, which is meant as, uh, as nature in Dante's uh, world. The users are committing uh, sin against uh, human art, as we already seen and uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to see again. The, the ones who are suffering most and, and complaining and crying out the most are the ones who are supine, the blasphemers. With um, all over the sand, distended flakes of fire drifted from aloft, slowly as mountain snow without a wind. Fantastic simile here. Um, you can see it in front of your eyes, these huge snowflakes almost of fire, slowly descending, and as soon as they touch the sand, they almost explode on the sand. I've also noticed that visually, uh, not only uh, Gustave Doré, but other illustrators tend to show this uh, fire flakes, this fire that is raining down, as raining in a diagonal direction. I don't know why, to be honest, because um, it seems to me pretty clear that they should be very straight and vertical from the description that Dante gives of uh, snow on a mountain um, when there is no wind around. So that's at least how I'm uh, picturing it. And here he refers to Alexander the Great, as when Alexander in India's hottest region saw flames fall on his army intact to the ground and had his soldiers tramp the accumulation to extinguish them before the fire could spread, etc. He is uh, referring, so the, the image is pretty clear and I'd be happy to just uh, read it as it is. If we go behind and look at the source of this image for Dante's uh, inspiration, uh, that should be uh, um, the Demeteoris by Albertus Magnus. It's uh, uh, somewhere, it, it's a writing where Albertus Magnus wrote about uh, uh, a letter from Alexander to Aristotle. This letter, though, was apocryphal. And we know that, at least. Probably Dante didn't know that. Where there is a little bit of confusion, both on the side of Albertus Magnus and uh, as a consequence of Dante's, on Dante's side, about the, the reason why Alexander's horses were stomping on, uh, on the floor, on the ground. In uh, the original, apparently, they were stomping on the ground to, uh, because it was snowing too much, and so to kind of compact the snow and make the, the ground a little safer. The way Albertus Magnus read it, they were stomping on the fire once, they, once, it, once it fell from the sky, from the enemy, or thrown from, from the enemies, to make sure that it would not spread too much uh, before the next um, ball of fire would just land around them. So, little details that make it really interesting to, to dig and to understand where some uh, ideas came to, to Dante. Eternal fire descended in such profusion, sand kindled like tinder under flint, and made the pain redouble. Um, with their dancing hands not resting, even for a moment, they pawed. These uh, supine uh, blasphemers, not only they are hit with these flakes of, 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 of fire, but as soon as the flakes of fire hit the sand, they almost fizzle and, and erupt in a small local explosion, being even more painful to them. And so they start uh, uh, clapping their, their body with their hands, which is a, a dancing motion, which uh, dancing hands, in fact, translates uh, perfectly um, la tresca, which is what Dante uses in Italian, which is dance. Um, in fact, in some other translations on the, on the um, Robin Kirkpatrick translation, I've seen a very uh, creative version of this line. 
where it says, arrestingly, the wretched hands jived on. Now up, now down, now high, now low, slap, clap. Uh, it's uh, an interesting and creative way to translate it. it it's trying to um, recall or resemble the, the or quindi or quinci that Dante uses, a, a repetition. And, uh, and I don't know if it's a, a great way to translate it, but I, I certainly uh, admire the, the imagination and the craft there. Who is that one, the great one seeming to pay no heed to the fire? Dante seeing somebody, and uh, this somebody is disdainful and scowling, and is uh, a very big in size, uh, almost gigantic as a, as a man, who doesn't seem to uh, feel the pain, and he certainly is not moving his hands like a dance, like the other ones. Uh, at the same time, there is a strange line here as well, where Dante finds it uh, appropriate to remind Virgil of his failure in uh, trying to get them through the doors of this, or the city of this. Why, why is Dante doing that? Uh, why is he... It, does this have to do with uh, their relationship that is becoming more and more confidential, more and more familiar? But, but Dante doesn't do anything by chance, so it's uh, a little unclear and mysterious why he thought it was a good idea here to to almost uh, uh, make Virgil feel bad about this. I really don't know. In any case, um, they, this guy seems disdainful and scowling so that the rain seems not to ripen him. And uh, the, the word for ripen in Italian is maturi. But uh, as a very quick aside, we know that uh, uh, in history, um, we don't have any manuscript of the Divine Comedy. Uh, Dante's original manuscripts have been lost for, for many centuries, so every copy that survived through, throughout the centuries uh, was an actual copy of his original manuscript. And as always in copying, there, there are always little mistakes here and there, little typos. This is a case where uh, um, many scholars believe there was a typo. Instead of Maturi, the original, must have been Marturi, which uh, uh, comes from uh, the martyrs, the martyrization. And, uh, and it would certainly make a little bit more sense than ripening. This, this um, rain of fire is not ripening um, this person, but is martyrizing this person, or it doesn't seem to be martyrizing this person, it's not causing pain. So this is another interesting detail. Uh, he appeared to hear me, so this person, um, without even waiting for Virgil to reply, very arrogantly replies to Dante directly, because he overhears him, and shouts, What I was alive, I am in death. Qual io fui vivo, tal son morto. This is probably the most important line of the entire canto, because um, Capaneo, this uh, character, is the quintessential sinner in the Divine Comedy. He is the quintessential sinner because he is so um, almost exaggerated in his being a condemned soul and uh, in, uh, in his defying God. Just like I was when I was alive, I am right now. Of course, Francesca was like that as well. She didn't have uh, anything to repent uh, for, of, and uh, many other sinners were like this, but, but not in such a spectacularly arrogant way as Capaneo. So here Capaneo uh, is uh, explaining his story in a very concise way and referring to, uh, as, as usual, classical myths and, uh, and classical um, stories in an extremely condensed way. Let me switch on my light because the sun is going down. Much better. Um, with all this might, Capaneo is a, a mythical character. Um, as we said, he's, uh, uh, he's coming from, uh, uh, very likely, from uh, uh, the 10th book, book 10 
of uh, Statius Thebaid, the Thebaid by Statius. Um, this is uh, another reason why it's important to consider the fact that, uh, uh, that Dante never does things by chance. If he's quoting somebody uh, or a character from a work by Statius, it's also because he wants to remind us about Statius. Statius was a poet that uh, Dante held in, in very high esteem. Most likely for him, he was almost the second favorite poet uh, after Virgil. And uh, this is also why in the last uh, final, let's say, stretch of Mount Purgatory, Statius will be Dante's guide in helping him uh, get to Eden. So we're going to find Statius as a character in the Divine Comedy. He is uh, repeating Capaneus the exactly the same type of attitude that he had in life, which is he's, he doesn't want to give uh, God, which Dante treats uh, blasphemy against uh, Zeus or blasphemy against Jupiter, just like as it was an equivalent of blasphemy against God. He is doing the same uh, now in his afterlife, and uh, uh, he's not, he doesn't want to give God the satisfaction of, of his vengeance, of uh, seeing him in pain, which is quite, um, quite spectacular, really, uh, in, in terms of uh, level of pride and level of uh, anger and, uh, and even will strength. So for the first time, uh, Virgil screams um, very, we could say, um, angry. My guide spoke with more force than I have ever heard, and he said, O Capaneus, that this unquenched pride remains, it tells him that uh, his real punishment is not as much the, the pain from the fire, but the fact that he is still consumed by his fury, by his, by his rage, as he just proved to them. About Capaneus, uh, Mark Musa has a, a great comment, like he usually does. He describes how uh, Statius writes about Capaneus. Uh, when scaling the walls of Thebes, he blasphemed against uh, Jupiter, who then struck him with a thunderbolt. Capaneus died with blasphemy on his lips. And at Phlegra, uh, Jupiter defeated the Titans who attempted to storm Olympus. This is why Vulcan is mentioned here. Vulcan, one of the titans. Vulcan and the Cyclops, of course, were the manufacturers of, this, uh, of the Thunderbolts. So this is an explanation of what was going on inside Mount Etna in Sicily. And so Capaneus is this uh, uh, really central character who embodies uh, the defiance against God and uh, the that spiritual attitude of uh, I am uh, uh, more powerful than God, I am independent, I don't want to uh, show any fear uh, of, of God. In silence, uh, Virgin, Virgil and Dante reach a um, small stream that is pouring so red that it still makes Dante shudder. Um, this small stream is, uh, needs to be imagined more like a canal because it's uh, artificial and it's got a uh, stone pavement. Uh, it's described here as issues that stream from Bulicame that is shared among the prostitutes. So this brook flowed down and across the sand. It was stone floored, stone lined both banks and the margins on each side. And so Dante becomes curious as soon as he sees this type of canal. And I could see that uh, this would be our route in all that I have shown you, my master said, since first we entered through that open gate, the doors of hell, whose threshold no one ever is denied, nothing your eyes have seen is so worth note at this pre as this present stream, which quenches in its flood all the flames above it. As by magic, almost, the, the flames that hit this canal uh, stop burning they don't explode in even more flames like they do when they hit the sand. So Virgil highlights the importance of this, of this stream. My master spoke and I asked him for the food to feel the appetite these words inspire. There's not even a need for, 
for Dante to ask a question and Virgil already knows uh, what the question is. That's how close the master and the pupil are becoming uh, at this point in Canto 14th already, which is not too far. It's uh, about um, one third of the way to purgatory here. So Virgil answered, in the middle of the sea lies a wasteland called Crete. He talks about, uh, he gives here one of the most elaborate allegories of the entire Divine Comedy. It is a magnificent image of a giant old man made of metals and different uh, substances and different uh, materials inside a mountain in Crete. Uh, this was the mountain where uh, Zeus was, uh, had, uh, was born and uh, uh, with the characteristic ability of Dante to condense very complex and long classical myths and histories into only a couple of lines, uh, he uh, takes a part of uh, a biblical uh, history, a biblical story, part of uh, Ovid's um, myth in, uh, in the Metamorphosis, and he puts them together and he adds something more to this uh, um, gran veglio, which means old man or great old man. So we are in front of a vision that uh, comes originally, without any doubt, from the book of Daniel in the Bible. The book of Daniel 2, uh, verses 32-35, talks about uh, Nabucodonosor's dream, which was this uh, uh, big, big man made of different uh, materials, and Daniel was the only one uh, who was able to interpret the dream for Nebuchadnezzar, interpreting it as different uh, reigns and different kingdoms um, coming and going in, in throughout history. This was then taken by Ovid, and uh, in the Metamorphosis, I believe in Book 1 of the Metamorphosis, uh, Ovid, Ovid talked about uh, the fact that uh, uh, they, the different ages in history would be represented uh, by a golden age to start with, and a silver age, a bronze age, and so forth. Um, again, I'm going to lean a little bit on Mark Musas here as a very clear explanation. The figure of the old man, this is Mark Musa um, writing, the figure of the old man is drawn from the book of Daniel, but the symbolism is different and uh, more nearly reflects uh, Ovid, Metamorphosis number one. The head of gold represents the golden age of man. In Christian terms, this would be before the fall. The arms and breast of silver, the trunk of brass, the legs of iron, uh, represent the three declining ages of man. The clay foot symbolizes the, the church, weakened and corrupt by temporal concerns. And, uh, and here is the probably original touch of Dante, that through the fissure that cracks every part of this figure below the gold, below the golden part, because the golden part is uh, um, the age of it, the golden age of man, age of innocence, where everything was perfect and ideal. Through this fissures, fissure uh, that cracks every part of the figure, the old man's uh, tears that represent the sins and sorrows of men throughout all ages, uh, stream out and pour out, and they form the, the rivers of hell, the three rivers of hell, um, Acheron, Styx, and Phlegeton, who then, they, they then um, link uh, together and uh, meet in this uh, canal that Dante is looking at just in front of him with red, bloody, bloody waters. So, in this very imaginative and allegorical way, Dante is telling us uh, something about uh, um, original sin, how original sin and its doctrine is uh, uh, visualized as these bloody tears coming down from uh, uh, the ages. The Gran Veglio, the old, uh, old man, uh, fundamentally represents history, human history, with its uh, all of its corruption, corruption given by sin. 
and uh, and this is why the hydraulics of uh, of the rivers uh, start exactly from this source and meet uh, in the end in this canal and then this canal goes goes forward and will uh, uh, end in the cochito which is the bottom of hell and uh, towards the end of the canto uh, dante asks virgil a couple of questions as he usually does the first one is uh, if this stream does fall thus from our world then why does it appear at only this border fair question and uh, um, virgil says as you know well the, this place is round and basically we haven't uh, covered the entire circumference of hell in our trip so far so the rivers coming down in a spiral it makes sense that you can see it only now that's uh, Virgil's answer in a, in a couple of words and uh, and he goes it should not bring amazement to your face and then Dante where are Leith and Phlegiton then uh, for you are silent regarding one of these um, and say the rain of tears creates the other and Virgil here it already starts losing his patience again with uh, with Dante, which is is a funny feature of uh, of their relationship. The fact that Dante needs to be really careful about the questions that he asks. All your questions please me. It's almost a, a way to start his answer uh, by uh, trying to call himself Virgil. All your questions please me, but in one case, the boiling of this red water should give the answer to you already. You should have already understood, uh, Dante, that uh, the boiling red of, of one of these is the flagitum. So you should have understood it by, by yourself. The other one, Le the Lethe or Lethe, and please bear with me because all these um, classical terms I've learned uh, uh, many years ago in Italian and I'm trying to do justice to their English version. Lethe, you shall see, but out of this abyss, in other words, uh, uh, Dante, you're going to see the, the river Leith as well, but not here. In, he will see it in Purgatory. It's the river where you wash in in order to forget your sins. It's going to be a really beautiful scene of Purgatory. And then, now it's time for us to leave the wood. The margins are not a fire and make a pathway behind me. Every flame is extinguished here. Um, I find it a, a really theatrical and, uh, and beautiful way to conclude uh, a very complex canto. It's uh, is extinguished here. The last line in Italian is sopra loro ogni vapor si spegne. It's a perfect ending for ending for uh, for this canto, like almost like the lights of a theater production that switch off at the end. So once again, thank you for uh, your company and for watching this video, listening to uh, a couple of thoughts about uh, Canto 14.